Welcome to week five of the role of women in ministry, a biblical perspective. Normally, I'm teaching this class to a room filled with men and women, but today I'm just doing it to the camera. When I taught it live to my class on Sunday, we had some te technical difficulties and we weren't able to record. So now it's just you and me studying together. So let's get right into it. Now, this is week five of a six-week series. We began in week one talking about the rules when it comes to, to interpreting scriptures and translating scriptures, some hermeneutical principles. And then week two, we looked at the first passage, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And we learned what scripture has to say when it comes to the role of men and women. Week three, we then looked at, uh, we did sort of a Bible survey. We looked at the roles that women have played historically in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Then week four, we studied the first Corinthians passage, the passage where Paul talks about women being silent in the church and him not permitting a woman to speak. It's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. We unpack that passage the last time we were together. Well, today we get to the, if you will, the mother of all passages, really, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's read it together. It's a letter that Paul wrote to a, a young pastor that he was mentoring named Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 8. Paul writes this. He says, therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, with holiness and propriety. What do you do with that? What does this mean? Well, let's do our best to unpack the meaning of the next few moments. Let's get the context, first of all. First Timothy uh, is the, the first of two letters that Paul wrote to this young pastor named Timothy. And in First Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 7, uh, actually describes the mission that Paul had assigned to Timothy. Paul was giving Timothy a mission. He was sent to Ephesus for a particular reason. Let's read it, 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 to 7. Paul writes, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, I urged you, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. So, you can see the mission that Paul has given to Timothy. He's telling Timothy, I want you to do a couple things. First, I want you to confront and address false teachers and false teaching in Ephesus. Timothy's in Ephesus when he receives this letter. Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus. He sent him there to confront um, and to, to address false teachers and false teaching in Ephesus. And secondly, Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus to confront and address those teachers who were arrogant in their attitude and limited in their understanding. That's what we read in verses 3 to 7 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. There's some teachers there. They're arrogant. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't even understand what they're teaching, he tells them. But there's more to the context. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, this is the Bible study, turn left from 1 Timothy and go to Acts chapter 19. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. Let's start first at verse 1. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and he arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples 
And uh, so there he met with some disciples and he begins his ministry in Ephesus. Let's keep reading what happened while Paul was in Ephesus, starting a church, planting a congregation there. It says, starting in verse 23, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way or about the gospel message, the church. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, we're about to meet Artemis. Artemis brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow, Paul, has convinced and led astray a large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. Paul says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. Now, there's danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, she'll be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. They seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials uh, of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. I love that statement. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So get this. For two hours, they shouted the slogan. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. 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 You're tired, and I've only done it for 12 seconds. They did that for two hours, we read here. These people were passionate about their goddess Artemis. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? That was the legend that this... The statue of Artemis fell from the heavens in Ephesus, and that's why the temple of Artemis was there in Ephesus. He says, therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they've neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. So there's this riot goes on. They're upset because they feel like Artemis, their goddess, whose temple is in Ephesus, is being maligned. They were passionate about Artemis. Well, who is Artemis? Well, hopefully you have an outline. If not, you can download one from our website. But let's look at the historical file of, on Artemis. First of all, Artemis was a Greek goddess. She was a Greek goddess. Secondly, the temple to Artemis dominated the city of Ephesus, both physically and culturally. So right in the heart of the city of Ephesus was this massive building. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was there from uh, 6 BC to 3 AD. It stood for centuries there um, at, uh, in the heart of, uh, of, of the city of Ephesus. So Artemis was a Greek goddess. The temple was, uh, dominated the city of Ephesus both physically and culturally. Thirdly, Artemis was the twin sisters of the god 
Apollo. So in the pantheon of Greek gods, Artemis and Apollo were twins, brothers and sister. Number four, according to Greek legend, Artemis was said to have been born first. So they were twins, but Artemis, the female, was born first before her brother Apollo. Now, it was taught that after being born, Artemis actually turned and helped the midwife deliver her brother Apollo. So she was a very nurturing person right from the beginning. Artemis is born first, then she turns and helps deliver her brother Apollos. Number five, Artemis was known for several things. First of all, she was called upon to protect women during childbirth. You see, from her very birth, she was there helping women during childbirth. Well, that was her nature, this goddess Artemis. She was called upon by people around the world to protect women during childbirth. She was a hunter goddess protecting animals from men. And according to Greek legend, she was not created per se, meaning she, was, she did not depend upon a man to bring her to life. She didn't come into to being uh, like a normal person through normal procreation. She didn't depend upon a man to bring her to life. Also, according to Greek legend, she was not deceived. In fact, she was known to be wise and superior to men in intelligence. Artemis was known to be more intelligent than men. She was incredibly wise, very knowledgeable, superior to men in intelligence. Number six, the temple to Artemis was known for its women priestesses. There were men too, but it was known for its women priestesses who in the spirit of their god Artemis taught everyone, especially men, in a domineering way. Again, with her strength and her protecting uh, women from men, and, and with her intelligence, she was known to be a domineering goddess, and her priestesses taught in a domineering way. Now, let's read 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 7 again. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. So we, we started in chapter 1 before, now we've moved into chapter 2. And uh, the main passage starts at verse 8, but let's read the context. Because remember, verse 8 starts with, therefore, therefore I urge you. Well, whenever you read the word therefore, look before that word so you can see what the therefore is there for. When you see therefore, it means based on everything I've just said, let me apply it. So what did he say at the beginning of chapter 2? Paul writes, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved. He says, um, he wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So Paul, in the first, verse, first seven verses of chapter two, Paul underlines the importance of submitting to proper authorities so that the testimony of the church will be strong and followers of Jesus will be able to live peaceful lives. So the context is, Immediate context is submitting properly into the proper authorities. Now comes the passage. Therefore, based upon that, about properly submitting to the authorities, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, as your outline says, Paul addresses some gender-specific issues that he has been made aware of in the Ephesian church. Now, remember, we learned the difference between, in, in our rules in week one, there's gender-exclusive and there's gender-specific. Gender-exclusive means I'm giving you instructions that only applies to men or instructions that only applies to women. It's exclusively for these genders. This is not a gender exclusive teaching he gives here in the first few verses of chapter, 
uh, of uh, eight, you know, verses eight to ten, we'll say of, of chapter two. This is gender specific, meaning Paul says. I'm speaking specifically to men, not exclusively to men, meaning he's not saying, uh, women, you don't have to pray with holy hands lifted up, and, and you can pray anger and disputing. I just don't want the men to pray with anger or disputing. And, and men, if you want, you can dress immodestly, and, and you can focus on the outward appearance. I'm just saying the women can't. No, he's speaking specifically to genders because he's heard of some specific issues tied with these issues with the men and women in Ephesus. So he's speaking gender specific, not gender exclusive. For example, as your outline says, with verse eight, he's saying men should pray passionately. Men should not fight and quarrel. They should pray passionately. They shouldn't fight and quarrel. So while this is gender specific, he's speaking specifically to men, it's clearly not gender exclusive. It doesn't apply only to men. This would apply to women as well. Having said that, Paul was apparently addressing an issue that was unique to the men in Ephesus at that time. And then verses 9 and 10, he turns to the women. I also want the women to dress modestly with decently and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now stop right there. Over the years, I know of groups of people who take that literally, meaning women cannot wear, uh, have nice hairstyles, elaborate hairstyles. They cannot wear gold. They cannot wear pearls. They cannot wear expensive clothing. How you define expensive, I suppose, is up to you. They say they take that literally. If you take this literally, then Paul is telling women to go around naked. Read it. I don't want them to dress with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but how should they dress? With good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Don't clothe yourselves with gold, pearls, hairstyles, or expensive clothes. Clothe yourselves with good deeds. You take it literally, you're stuck with it literally. That's not what he's saying here. You have to understand the spirit of what Paul's saying here. So what he's teaching is, listen, again, it's gender specific, not gender exclusive. He's certainly not saying that women are, or that men are allowed to dress immodestly, flaunt their wealth and focus on their outward appearance. He's simply addressing an issue that was unique to the women in Ephesus at that time. Verse 11, he says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. So here, Paul continues to address the women in Ephesus by telling them that they should come to church with humble hearts, willing to learn from those who know the scriptures better than they do. In other words, Paul is telling them to leave their Artemis attitude at the door. Check it at the door. Paul is telling them that the teaching that women are superior to to and smarter than men has no place in the church of Jesus Christ. Remember, remember verse 3 of chapter 1. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Remember verse 7. He says in chapter 1, they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Apparently, women had an issue here. Perhaps this Artemis attitude that there was, uh, was leaking into the church. And Paul says, women, no, don't do that. I'm not allowing this to happen. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, don't you allow this to happen either. In fact, look at verse 12. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, this verse is the center, the heart of it all. The beginning of this verse, literally in the original language reads, I am not now permitting a woman to teach a man in this way. I am not now. In the original Greek, the the, the verb tense is present, indicative, active present indicative active verb tense. So Paul is literally saying, at this time, in light of the present circumstances, this is how I'm responding. I am not now permitting a woman to teach. Now, uh, scholars differ on how specific Paul is being. Is he just saying, here's what I don't allow at all at any time? Or 
Is he specifically speaking about that time at that moment? It could be taken either way. I think the context leads in one direction, but it could be taken either way. But literally what he writes is, I am not now permitting a woman to teach a man. Uh, in, well, we're going to get to how he qualifies the type of teaching he's not allowing. Now, here's the key. This entire passage hinges on one word in this verse. One word. And it's the word authentine. Authentine. That's a N. The last one is a letter N. A-U-T-H-E-N-T-E-I-N. That's the key word in this whole verse. In fact, the whole issue of women in ministry could be argued all comes down to this one crucial word. It's translated in the version I'm using, the New International Version, it's translated to assume authority over. To assume authority over. Now here's the thing. This ancient Greek word has been a source of great debate for centuries. In fact, this is the only time this word is used in the Bible. Okay? It's a rare Greek word, and it's not used any other place by Paul or by anyone else in the Bible. Historically, authentane has two meanings. It has a negative meaning as a positive meaning. Negative meaning in the sense that it's not ever uh, considered a positive use of the word, and positive meaning there's, there's a possible context where it could be ac accepted. You'll see what I mean as we unpack these definitions. The negative meaning of this word means to dominate, or to assume, or presume, or usurp authority, meaning to improperly take authority, to steal authority, to grab what's not yours. To, so to dominate, to, to use authority that's not properly yours, it even meant to do violence. It would even mean at times to kill. So that's what we're saying. There's the negative context. It's never good to, to dominate. It's never good to usurp authority or to do violence or to kill. So that's what we mean with the negative context. But it was also used historically in a positive context where it came to mean to exercise authority over. Now, there are all kinds of positive ways you can exercise authority there's nothing intrinsically wrong about exercising authority, unlike usurping or dominating or, or doing violence, okay? So, there's, historically, this word, rare Greek word, has, been, has been, had a negative connotation, and it's had a positive con connotation over the centuries. But here's the key insight. According to studies done by uh, scholars and historians and grammatical scholars, Greek scholars, if you will, the historical usage of this word prior to Paul's usage of this term. So before he wrote the letter to Timothy, historically, every usage of this word is always negative. Meaning, it was always the usurp, dominate, violence, even kill. Before Paul used this word in 1 Timothy chapter 2, every instance we have historically, um, and they're all secular usages, because as we said, it's not found in the Bible, every usage of it historically is negative. It was never used in the context of to assume authority over, to exercise authority over, until after Paul wrote this. Only, the positive meaning only came in centuries afterwards. So as we look back, folks, this is the key. It would be reasonable to assume that since when Paul used the word, that it had a negative connotation, it would be reasonable to assume that his readers knew it, or took it in a negative way. Okay? Because that's how it had always been used up till that point. So the context of their hearing that word was always negative. The positive context only happened centuries after Paul wrote this letter. Before that, at that time, the word had a negative connotation. Okay? And so you can see how translators uh, of the New International Version, for example, have tried to, 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 to thread the needle. They, they've tried to balance this out. Because there's debate about, you know, um, do we use it in the negative context or do we use it in the positive context? And they've tried to thread the needle. They have 
I don't allow a, a woman to assume authority over. So not just exercise, not the positive, but not the full negative either. It's assume authority to maybe take on authority that they don't have perhaps. So they're, they're, translators of the NIV have tried to kind of walk the middle ground, if you will. Having said all of that, with the cultural background of the Artemis cult, the haughty attitude of the Artemis cult, along with the textual background of the ancient usage of this word, verse 12 could be translated this way. I am not now permitting a woman to teach in a way that usurps authority over a man. Paul says, I am not now allowing a woman to teach in a way that usurps authority, authority over a man. I won't let that happen. Uh, Timothy, and you shouldn't let it happen either. For example, this is the way the King James Version has, has translated authentane, if you will. So, verse 12 was a gender-specific prescription, although, again, not necessarily gender-exclusive, in response to a, a current circumstance in the Ephesian church. That being said, women bringing an, unly, uh, uh, an ungodly and haughty attitude into the church. That's what we're saying here. That Paul was saying, I am not allowing women. And Paul and Timothy, you should neither. You should not allow women to bring an ungodly and haughty attitude into the church services. And in verse 12, Paul appears to have been responding to point six in the Artemis cult uh, checklist that, you know, women were teaching in a dominating way in the Artemis cult. Well, in the next three verses, Paul continues to dismantle the Artemis attitude by touching on a few other false teachings from the Artemis cult that women were bringing in the church. Remember, that uh, point four in the Artemis checklist that we gave was the fact that Artemis was created first, or, or she was born first, I should say, before her brother Apollos. Well, with that in mind, read verse 13 again of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Okay? Paul is saying, listen, you have been taught that in, in the temple that Artemis was first, and then the male, Apollos, was second. Well, Paul's pointing out this is, in fact, not true. Paul points out that, biblically speaking, Adam was formed first. That's what he says in verse 13. Adam was formed first and then Eve. Now, this is crucial. Some have taught that in this verse, Paul is referring to the creation order of Genesis 1 and 2. A basis for, as a basis for men ruling over and having headship over women. Now, remember... When we, in week two, when we studied Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we addressed this, knowing that 1 Timothy 2 was coming. Remember, we discovered it. If you don't remember, if you weren't with us in that class, go back to week two. Where we studied verse by verse Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The fact is, as we learned back then, that there is nothing in Genesis 1 and 2 that specifically teaches any such thing. There is nothing in Genesis 1 and 2 that teaches uh, that the chronology of the creation order uh, signified priority or, or dominance over the other. All references to men ruling over women occur after the fall as a result of sin in Genesis chapter 3. Men ruling over or men dominating women is nowhere to be found in God's original design. It has to be imported into Genesis 1 and 2 since it's not in the original text. Remember, we learned that the whole concept of male headship is nowhere to be found in Genesis 1 and 2. The only time the word head or headship is used is in the very first verse, in the beginning, God created. At the head, God created uh, the heavens and the earth. And the only other time is when it talks about in the Garden of Eden, the headwaters of the river. Nowhere is headship taught in Genesis 1 and 2 at all. Go back to week 2 when we studied Genesis 1 and 2, and you'll see, you'll be reminded. Paul is not referring to the creation order as a way of describing some biblical teaching about men ruling over women. Paul is referring to the creation order as a way of debunking a false teaching about women ruling over men. It's the exact opposite of what we import into this. We read that, well, men were created first, then women, as a way of, see, men rule over women. No, no, that's not why Paul is going back to Genesis 1. 
because Genesis 1 doesn't teach that men dominate women. He's going back to Genesis 1 and 2 to remind the people of Ephesus that actually our, the woman wasn't created before the male. The woman wasn't before the male. Actually, Adam was created and then Eve. So if we're going to be truthful to how things really began, people of Ephesus, you Artemis, former old Artemis cult members, the truth is Artemis had it backwards. Adam was created before Eve. So women don't rule over men based on Artemis being born first. Truth is, Adam was created before Eve. That doesn't mean Adam rules over Eve, but let me just correct you people of the former Artemis cult members. Artemis has got it backwards. The men were actually created first. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Paul is saying, now, you have been taught that Artemis is never deceived and is much smarter and wiser than men. This is, in fact, not true. Paul says, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, again, we need to pause here and address a false view that many people take away from a surface reading of verse 14. Many seem to think that Paul is saying the Adam, you know, the man, Adam, wasn't deceived. The woman, Eve, she was the one who was deceived. And this is why women cannot teach men. It's because women are so easily deceived or more prone to being deceived. Folks, this is not at all what Paul is saying. He is not teaching that men are smarter than women. He is debunking the false teaching of the Artemis cult that women are smarter than men. Again, we, we, we flip it backwards. Think this through. If we take this verse, verse 14, in, in the way that many seem to take it, Paul would be saying, women are easily deceived. That's why women are not allowed to teach men. However, these easily deceived women, they're more than welcome to teach each other and teach the children as well. Does that make sense to you? Women are easily deceived. That's why they can't teach men. But they can teach other women. And they can teach the children, and, you know, who are in their formative years. Yeah, we'll let the, the most deceptive people amongst us teach other women. And we'll let them teach our children as well. That doesn't even make sense. But that's what you have to believe if you think that Paul is saying women are more easily deceived. So that's why they can't teach men. He doesn't say that's why they can't teach at all. That's why they can't teach men. It doesn't make sense. Let's look at verse 15. Let's read it together. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. What do we do with that? Is Paul teaching that women are saved by having babies? Well, that completely goes against everything Paul teaches elsewhere. It's salvation by grace. Uh, through faith, not, not of works, not of ourselves, so no one can boast. And what about those women who cannot or never will have children? It can't mean that women are saved by having babies, so then what does it mean? It appears that Paul is, once again, confronting the false teaching of the Artemis cult regarding Artemis' role of protecting women during childbirth. Paul is saying, listen, it is not Artemis who protects women, it is Christ who protects women. Paul's laying down a general rule of thumb, a proverb, when he writes, but women will be saved, protected, shielded through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Again, a proverb is a general rule of thumb. It's not a guaranteed promise. It's as we learned when we studied Proverbs a, a couple summers ago in our series, Ancient Tweets, we called it. And we talked about a proverb is not a guarantee. It's a probability. It's, it's a general rule of thumb. It's a proverb says, all things being equal, you can generally expect this to take place. And that's what he's doing here. Listen, the most dangerous time in a woman's life, it could be argued, is when she's giving birth. Particularly a century, 2,000 years ago, when the medical community was not nearly as advanced as it is now. Many women were close to death and died giving birth. It was a scary time. And so that's what they would call, they would call out to Artemis. And he's saying, don't call out to Artemis. Call out to Christ. Well, let's conclude. 
When you place this letter and specifically this passage in its proper historical context, I believe the original meaning becomes quite clear. Paul was not teaching that women are inferior to men or that women uh, have no place in leadership and no ability or right to teach. No, Paul was responding to a specific situation at a specific time in a specific culture. However, the guiding principles that Paul laid down are applicable at all times and to all cultures. Well, I've done my best to unpack this thorny passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I hope it helps you. I hope it gives you something to think about. Next time we're together, our final week of the six-week series, What I'm going to do is step back and I'm going to do a 30,000 foot view of everything we've learned in this series. We've had six puzzle pieces over the last six weeks. Next week, I'm going to put all the pieces together and we're going to uh, look at the whole puzzle, the whole picture in one fell swoop, revisit everything we've learned over the last six of the last five weeks. And in that six weeks, we're going to Pull it, pull it all together and conclude. I hope you join us for week six of this series on women in ministry, a biblical perspective. Thanks for joining us today.